Hi, this IG Live is uh, titled Divorce and Confidence. Whilst we know divorce happens more often than we'd like it to happen around us, it's somehow something that we struggle to talk about and that we tend to hide, especially when we come from certain cultures and uh, we find it difficult to share it with, uh, with others. And we try sometimes to share it with wrong people, etc. I've helped a few, a few people um, around different topics and divorce was a coincidence that it was happening at the same time. So when I actually met um, Natasha and I found out that divorce coaches actually exist, I was uh, eager to have her talk about why she decided to become a divorce coach and what she's learned throughout the years of being a divorce coach. So I see that Natasha has joined and I will not waste any more time and invite her uh, to the live. Let's wait a few seconds and she should be able to join. Hi, Hi. Natasha. Hey, Hi, nice to see you. Nice to see you too. How are you? Very good. Thank you very much. I'm here uh, at my mom's um, place so it's a nice change of scenery for 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 us for the kids hi Sonia mm -hmm. I see we joined by a few people so yes we wanted I wanted to kind of um, to kind of start by asking you you know <clears throat> there's so many coaches out there in this uh, in this world and it's a very crowded profession and I just want to hear why you've chosen to specialize in divorce and how how it came about if you can tell me a bit, a bit about your story yeah, sure. So it's been about eight and a half years now, I think, since I, um, sorry, can you hear me? Because I can almost hear an echo. I can hear echo. you very well, yes. So it's been about eight and a half years. And what I found when I first got separated was because I'd sort of made that decision, there were so many people who were in very similar situations who felt like I had all the answers and I really didn't. So they would, you know, talk to me and be like, what should I do? I don't know what to do. And I'd always say, well, I can't tell you what to do because everyone's situation and everyone's circumstances are really different. It really depends on, you know, what, like the situation that you're in. Um, and then I moved back to London from Hong Kong and I was living here and I, I qualified to be a coach. I was certified, but it's not something I did full time. Um, but over the course of that time, when I did speak to certain people, people did, people were getting divorced or they were having issues with relationships. And as I mentioned to you, I've lived all around the world. And what I found was that it didn't matter where anyone lived or where they were from, um, the feelings, the emotions, and the beliefs around divorce were pretty much the same for anyone. But the more kind of deeper that I dug into this, I found that people within the South Asian community, which is you know the community that I'm part of more specifically, had a little bit of a tougher time than everyone else. And that was because of the taboo associated with divorce within the South Asian community. Um, and so, yeah, I made that something that I started looking into a bit more. And you've, uh, <laughs> you decided from your personal experience and the taboo that we will, we will um, go a bit deeper and understanding what you mean by taboos and misconception, especially I, if I understand properly in the South Asian community, but you've decided to become a divorce coach uh, to specialize mm -hmm. in that mostly because you felt there was a lot of demand from um from ladies that were going through it and they were struggling to talk about it was that one of your main reasons yeah they were struggling to to talk about it and to just like i think with like a lot of coaching, it's all quite similar. But with divorce coaching, you know, it is said that divorce is the second most, like, biggest trauma that you would go to with death being the first one. And with regards to the grief pattern that follows um, post-divorce, it's very similar to death. So going through, like, you know, the, the acceptance and the, the, the denial and all the different phases. Um, and so, yeah, being able to help people specifically with divorce, I found was quite different to just being able to help people as a general, um, as a general coach. Okay, that's, uh, that's something also that I'd love to hear about more, this, the, the relationship from uh, the, tra the traumatic experience and how you relate it to the cycle of, uh, of you know, grief and death, etc. That's something, do you mind telling me a little bit more about that? 
Yeah, yeah. So it can be a traumatic experience because most women that I speak to, when they come out of a divorce, they end up blaming themselves. So there's this idea of like, what could I have done better? What did I do wrong? And even if you know that it's not your fault and the reason that divorce happened, it's like. how could i have changed so he didn't act that way with me right and there's all this like blame and so when you you know work with a divorce coach it's about peeling back those layers as such that you've kind of created when you've um taken sort of blame for that and there's a big difference between blame and responsibility so i'm a big believer that whatever happens to you in your life you should take responsibility for it because then you can make the change that you need to move away from that traumatic experience but blame is blame is completely different um and also to be honest i found that a lot of people if they have a divorce coach to deal with the emotional side of things they'll end up spending far less on their divorce because they're not so triggered by everything that's happening around them so divorce can be very triggering right um unlike you know when we compare it to death unlike death you know it's, it's the end of something divorce is the end of a relationship but you still have that person constantly triggering you um and so if you've worked with a divorce coach and you're able to take care of what's on the inside essentially like your your mental well-being then the way things present on the outside is quite different and so when they're fighting over i don't know wanting to keep a nice mug you're not going to be like no i want that mug and suddenly you spent another 300 pounds in legal fees because your lawyers are fighting about a mug or a picture or something you just yeah. approach it quite differently i guess um and uh, hello to everyone who's joined please ask your questions mm -hmm. whatever questions you may have around divorce and confidence uh, we we were talking about why natasha decided to become a divorce coach and uh, the 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 mindset around the traumatic mindset around going through a divorce and how um women tend to blame themselves for for the relationship not going through the way they hoped and also how important it, it was to have a divorce coach in those moments because you can save on legal fees quite a lot uh, but i guess as well what what i wanted to ask you was you know what when is the best time to come and and speak to you would that be because i understand you do pre divorce consultations as well as um during divorce consultation but would that would you say that even just having the thought of divorce even mm -hmm. if you're in a relationship and things are going uh, it, it's it's always it's always a bit of a struggle right any relationship i i especially with young kids i don't think i i know mm -hmm. any of my um close friends who can say that they have a perfect relationship mm -hmm. so you know when you start having those thoughts a bit negative thoughts etc would you say that it's it's maybe better to come and speak with you at at that time or would it be better to speak to a relationship coach you know what you know what what is the benefit of of speaking with you a divorce coach rather than a relationship coach yeah so i do i do speak to people for both for the relationship and divorce but i would say the minute the thought crosses your mind is when you should be speaking to like a relationship or divorce coach i do i do both Um and that's because a lot of the times when I speak to people pre-divorce it's it's really not about getting divorce or assisting them in the process it's about trying to save that and I I'd always say you know you should try and save it a lot of the times it's just communication or lack of communication that leads to it and I also I'm a believer that if you choose if the person chooses to get divorced then you want to ensure that you have done whatever you can to try and make that relationship work right like i'm not in the business of saying like divorce is so easy these, these days so you know oh it's not working don't worry about it like just get yeah. divorced no way that's not sort of you know the way i kind of see things i think it is really important to kind of work on it and just to give you an example i speak to some people and they've been married for many many years and i might ask them like okay what is your partner's love language like how does he express that he loves you and they don't they don't know they're like oh oh i never thought about it like i don't i don't know and so often we want to be loved the way we want to be loved rather than the way the person has you know is able to love us and so i would say if if the thought has crossed your mind come and speak yeah, to yeah. come and speak to a coach because it could be communication but i love it. the lang love language analogy <laughs> and uh i I sometimes I forget, you know, and I just google mm. them again because I, I'm like okay, so what are they again? 
Um, do you do you know them uh, by heart? Just so we so can share with it the love yeah. languages. I think I think I probably know about four. So it's um, touch is one of them. Um, words of like affirmation and positive words are another one. I think things um, giving gifts and things are another one. Yeah, Being present is another one, and I can't remember the fifth. But yeah. it's, and it's how people express their love. So some people, if you've had an argument, right? they don't you know necessarily have it in them to come and apologize but they might come home with like a gift and that's how they're expressing their apology ah of, we have or, somebody listening here saying acts of service, service. Yeah. yeah thank yeah, you so as so acts of service some partners be like oh my partner never does anything and it's like well actually he took your car for a wash on saturday morning he you know um yeah went, picked up the groceries and all the little things and that's how he expresses his love but we don't notice them because we think of them as day-to-day -day things yes exactly and we you, <laughs> you won't give it the same importance <laughs> uh, words of affirmation acts of service receiving gifts quality that's time great. and physical touch definitely and yeah. I, I remember once uh, someone telling me that you know their partner was uh, their love language was physical touch and she was feeling really sad about something and so he he wanted to actually have um like a intimate moment with her and uh for her it wasn't physical touch at all the mm -hmm. the, the love language and later on when she realized about those love languages she was like okay so he was actually to trying to comfort me it wasn't mm -hmm. just you know it wasn't just a selfish act uh, that that uh, that he was um he wasn't thinking about or anything. So it's true that when you understand it, you can avoid uh, miscommunication or or fights, etc. Et but it it is it is very very hard work. So mm. look, when, when I, the other the other thing I want to say. So let's say you decide you okay, the decision has been made, and unfortunately, you know, divorce is it feels to be the only option, right? Mm. You were talking about the misconceptions about. Um, and marriages and I would love to hear more about that what are those misconceptions that that women go through before they make when they know that it's the only decision that that is the right decision for the couple to separate you know what is it that yeah. hold them back yeah so with the, most of the women that I come across it's this idea that I have to make my marriage work and I know I most certainly felt that as well. So when I left, it was like, everybody's going to think I couldn't make my marriage work. And add a child onto that and you have a, you know, you have a child, then it's like, oh, you walked away. Like you had the child, you should have stayed for the child. And there's all these like layers and you will rarely hear, I mean, I'm, I'm also speaking more generally and, and to the South Asian community, but across the board, you rarely hear someone say he should have made his marriage work. Like, oh, look, he didn't make his marriage work. The expectation is and the responsibility, and it's a huge responsibility because, you know, we use the phrase it takes two to tango and it does, right? It takes two people to make any relationship, whether that's a relationship you know, uh, like a marriage or whether that's a friendship or even between parent and child with any relationship, it takes two people to, to make that work. You can't have one person dragging the other person, you know, in this relationship, but the responsibility is always placed um, on the woman. Like, oh, she didn't make her. And I've heard that phrase, you know, growing up, but you'd always hear it, you, you know, and I suppose it's the same with parenting, right? The child does something wrong and it's like, oh, did the mother not raise her, him or her, right? <laughs> You know, and we see Gerlin is saying that there's an echo. Is the echo still there, Gerlin? When Natasha I talks, hear an echo on my side. Oh, I, I took my airpods out thinking that would help. Okay, it, can do you hear it from your mm -hmm. side or also from my side? Just when I speak. Okay, let me try and remove my uh, cover. Maybe that's that's it. One second. <laughs> okay, try and speak now. Is that better? Yeah, I don't hear an echo now. Oh, it might be the cover. Yeah, I took that. Yeah, yeah, I'm holding it. Only mm -hmm. when Natasha is talking. Okay. Yeah, hopefully it's not too, too bad so that we can hear all the wonderful things that you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, no, you were, you, it's better now. Okay, thanks, Gerlin. Um, so, yes, you were saying how the, the woman takes most of the blame, but then how, how can she, you know, overcome it? What are the stages for her to overcome it when she works with you? What, what are the things that you find is, are helping her 
um, yeah. overcome that stage of of uh, of shame and guilt and and the negative self talk. Mm. So a lot of it, we start with kind of when I said peeling back the layers, it's literally going back to. to thinking about what are the beliefs that she's holding with regards to what she think what she thinks a marriage might look like so if for example and then we might look at stuff that she was told stuff that she heard stuff that she saw growing up and sometimes it's not things that people directly told you so um i was quite you know blessed my parents never sort of put that pressure on me such or told me that marriage had to be a certain way my mom you know worked so in terms of looking at a role model i didn't see just someone making all the sacrifices but it was things i heard around me you know my entire life so people would praise like if a woman made sacrifices or the the whole um kind of narrative around what a daughter in law had to be like what the expectations were what um you know marriage would look like what a man was allowed to do um all those beliefs that i heard then kind of or all those things i heard then led me to believing that i was the one that had to make the sacrifices i remember um shortly before i ended up moving back i, I was having a general conversation with someone of an older like generation um and he turned around and said something to me like oh you know men will sort of do what they want as long as they come back to your bed and their slippers are by your side you know your side of the bed every morning and i just remember thinking what like really like like that that's it free pass as long as yeah. you come home at night as long as your slippers are in my room and not in someone else's like that kind of thinking still very much um you know exists yeah girlin says she was brought up with the same beliefs but the the thing with that is that that's why a lot of people don't leave because they've made this belief that if i leave i couldn't make a marriage work i couldn't keep my keep my husband and basically what it comes down to the the crux of it is i am not good enough yeah i am yeah. not good enough and so looking at where those beliefs came from and then asking yourself the question but do i believe that and if you don't then okay what do i want to believe instead and almost like rewiring yourself and the more your your thoughts and the more that you can sort of do that and write a new belief right and almost change those neural pathways you start to let go of that sense of failure that shame and all of that that only comes because you're holding all these mis- mislaid beliefs about what divorce means exactly exactly when what you're saying about not acting on it mm-hmm. or waiting a very long time before you make the decision because you your belief is that it's your responsibility 100% and not mm-hmm. not not even 50 50 but it's just that it's 100% your responsibility mm-hmm. and i see a lot of analogy with the way that a lot of people see motherhood as well you know mm-hmm. and the responsibility on mothers and sometimes how we women are also guilty of not giving any space to our partner because we were raised maybe in a family that was um a very male dominant where the mother was staying at home um and we get married it there's a generation gap we we live abroad like you we we travel we get married with um people that maybe have lived in in you know a foreign country as well that are more open minded and then we uh think that you know the women should be the one doing everything at home and we think that's the way it should be even if we don't want to because we also want to work right so there's mm-hmm. all these nuances that i find very tricky so i have uh, a women that i used to coach with the main breadwinner um and she was complaining about that and her husband actually wanted to do more around the house but she wasn't realizing that she was actually not allowing it because she knew only one way of mothering which was how her mother used to mother mm-hmm. you know and mm-hmm. i think um coaching is very very powerful and dynamic there uh compared to therapy therapy is fantastic as well but what i find in coaching is that the the tools that we use right are really dynamic and mm-hmm. and you really question those things quickly um and, and i find you see those shifts very quickly i don't know what 
what you think about that. And I know that you talk about something very interesting, the PT party. <laughs> and that's, that's something that only coaches can, you know, bring up like that and say, okay, my clients, I see a link between all my clients and that's the PT party. I think, tell us more about that. Yeah. And I completely agree with you. I've had a lot of questions recently about this coaching versus therapy thing and what one gives you and what, you know, what the other gives you. And I find that with coaching, it's very action based. It's very dynamic, as you say, and you just, it's very forward facing. So even with, um, you know, divorce, we'll talk about it once, maybe in the first session. And then after that, I won't ask someone to keep retelling their story. I'll, I'll tell you why. Yeah. I'll tell you about that. Hi, later. Simona. I see there's more people who have joined. Thank you. Yeah. Simona, Jennifer. Hi. Um, but in response to your question about the pity party. So my belief is that, you know, when you get divorced or when you throw any party, people will come to the party that you throw. So if you throw yourself a pity party where you're like, oh, you know, I got divorced, he did this, and this is what it's like, and you're just really, really feeling sorry for yourself, which I will say you're allowed to do. You're allowed to do initially because everyone needs to have those feelings. That's really important to, you know, not negate those feelings. But if you continue to do that and you stay in that victim mentality and you throw yourself a pity party, everybody will come to that party. But if you throw yourself a kind of confident party, everyone will come there as well. And what I mean by that is, so when I, you know, first moved back and I got over that whole like, oh no, you know, I feel like the victim. And I would talk to people, people's first reaction when you're like, oh, I'm, I'm divorced or I'm a single parent. It's like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And you can like see the pity, like, oh, I don't know how you do it. And the minute you stay there, that's it. Whereas if you're like, oh no, I'm, I'm like happily divorced. I'm like in a much better place. I really love my life. You should watch them meet you there. They'll be like, oh, cool. Great. You know, <laughs> that's cool. That's really cool. Like, you know, and, yeah. and it's so, it's so just it, the experience of that, like having, you know, someone look at you with pity versus having, having someone look at you in awe almost for having the courage to make a decision and to be happy with your decision even when the world around you is telling you that you know yeah, you yeah. shouldn't be almost that 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 moment that moment is is huge and so I think do not throw yourself a pity party because they will come there <laughs> that's it I love your you've come up with this term pity party yeah, so I love analogies. <laughs> I find that they're the easiest way to like yeah. explain things. For so sure. I'm to come up with analogies for um, how Galeen I feel. Galene is loving much. it as well. She's saying she's been yeah. to many of those, Galene. We'd love to hear <laughs> more of your stories for sure. <laughs> Clearly, you, you know a lot um, mm. and you, you, you would add a lot to this life. Um, but, you know, Natasha, when it's, it's true that when... Um, and you say you're allowed to have your moment of pity. You're allowed to have your moment of mourning and it's important to have it. And, and possibly you can have it and maybe ask yourself, right? Who is there when you're having that moment, right? Mm -hmm. what, what do you think of, of that analogy? Because if it's a party and if you're going through that pity party because you need to go through it, but it's not a, an open party to everybody. It's like a party to to people that you will choose. And how do you how do you know who you can open up to? And um, is this when coach coaching is actually very useful as well? I guess. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I think it's when you first come out. If you haven't started working with a coach yet, then it really is about trial and error. We have a visitor here. No, I no. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, it really is about trial and error, but I would say go with how you go with how you feel. So if you meet with someone and you're telling, you know, your story and they're saying stuff back to you, if you come out of that conversation feeling drained, then that's not somewhere that you need to be at, right? It's really important to get in tune with your energy and how you feel when you come out of a certain you know conversation you, like I'm sure you've experienced it before and you know I'm sure almost everyone listening to it before where you hang out with someone and you're you know you're talking and you go back and there's just the uh, kind yeah. of you know feeling um, and that's not what you want to be 
around when you're yeah. kind of going through this. So when I meet with clients for, you know, divorce, my first thing will be to ask them if they have a support network in place. So do they have someone that they can speak to? Do they have someone who will drag them out for a walk, you know, to get some physical exercise or to get some movement or to get some fresh air? Um, is there someone who, if they do have a moment of just like, I, w I don't even want to say weakness, but a moment of feeling down, yeah. but they can call up and be like, can you come have a glass of wine with me? Or can we just go out or whatever it is? So you do need a support system, but that's where boundaries become really important in that, in that first kind of few months after you've, um, after you've separated, because you really want to ensure that you have boundaries in place where no one's overstepping or making you feel worse than, um, than yeah. you are. and I'll, I'll give you an example. When I, um, you know, got divorced, there was someone I think who spoke to my mom, like an, you know, older kind of generation, um, an, an aunt, and she was like, oh, because, uh, you know, she has a child, you should make sure that you send her back. Almost like I was this FedEx package that had arrived wrongly, and my parents had to pack me up with my kid and send me back. Um, and, and obviously, you know, in that moment, those are not the people and the things that you want to be hearing and, and stuff and have the people around you but I will say that I think when they saw me live those live my life happily those same people now are very happy for me and very supportive and very amazing so I also think that people will project their beliefs onto you right their generation believed that because I had a child that's it like I had to you know go back and they project those beliefs onto you and so not having that around you as you're trying to navigate these new emotions and feelings is really important yes and you, you i guess it's even stronger in the south asian community i'm married i am married to a pakistani um mm. and i see around his family and uh, there's been divorces uh, very close divorces as well and and it is a uh, very taboo you don't talk about mm. it you hide it and then it takes longer to kind of, of say it with confidence. I'm a, I'm a happy divorced uh, person, a single mom, and I'm working and I'm doing this and that because there's always a bit of judgment and there's always a mm -hmm. bit of um, taboos and you have to actually be comfortable that you won't be able to control what people say about you and being comfortable with what people say about you. And when, you, when you're raised in a, in a place where actually people care about what people say about mm -hmm. you that takes even more work and it's even more yeah. challenging right um then if you if you were raised in a in a community where you you've learned from the beginning that you need to become resilient to what other people say and you, you know your your worth is not dependent on what other people say mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. even though it's very it's it's still you know in the in your in in anglo-saxon community etc in in the american community i know that in schools they teach you to you you know to do public speaking very early in life and not caring mm -hmm. about what other people think etc and it's not necessarily the case for for other cultures so uh, and for other type of uh, uh, education or schools etc so i i i admire um you know the all the the work that you do around that because it's mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a real process. It's not easy. It takes a while. And I'm wondering, how do you support your clients uh, in between the sessions, especially if they go through a big, a big, like emotional moment and they need the support, like you're saying? Um, mm -hmm. Do you yeah. do you do you, do, you, do you have a chat system? Do you yeah. how do you support them? So I'm available on WhatsApp. So even at the end of a call, I'll say to them, like, if you need me, just WhatsApp me. Um, you know, because I want to be able to support them. But what, yeah. I try and do a lot of like the, you know, so it depends. So if it's, it, it's different for a divorce sort of client versus someone who's not, you know, not divorced. You know, with, with someone who's going through a divorce, a lot of the work that we do and a lot of like the actions that we do where to someone else I might be able to say, oh, you can do this for your homework. So we deal with it in the next session. When going through a divorce, we'll do that within the session because it's really important to be there in those moments as they're kind of coming to those yeah either aha moments or dealing with it because it can bring up a lot of emotions, right? If you imagine like, I don't know, all these wires kind of that have been laid down for many, many years and they're all facing this way. And essentially you're kind of picking them up and having to change the way that you see things. That's quite a... Oh, did you receive a call? Yeah, uh, no, it's an alarm. <laughs> That's quite a messy, you know, 
process and it can bring up a lot of emotion. So you want to make sure, like I want to make sure that I'm there in that moment when we're doing that process and, or at least begin it. And then they may just finish it as homework, but they can WhatsApp me throughout the week whenever, yes, you know, whenever they need the support. Yes, I, I was thinking about that, that, you know, for relationship coaching as well as, but especially for divorce, which is even more going through something that traumatic, you know, how, how, how clients would need that extra support. And yes. um, thank you so much for, for being my guest today. I wanted uh, for you to, to tell the audience how they can connect with you best. And if there's anything you're working on, you know, share with us for the, for the new year, if you've got anything, any exciting yeah. project or news sure. you want to share with us. <laughs> so um, I, I just wanted to quickly touch on the point that I was saying earlier around the kind of scientific reason of why you shouldn't keep repeating your your story because a lot of people you know sort of do that and the fact is our body doesn't know the difference between what is happening now and what has happened to us in the past and so so often say I have a, a client and we're I think we're doing really well and then suddenly she comes in you know one day and she's like quite upset and it's because you know in this particular instance she just had this full-blown conversation with a friend who she hadn't seen in a while who then asked her like oh what's going on and she kind of retold the entire story and what you're doing then is you're literally taking your body from the here and now and placing your body back in that moment of trauma and you're reliving it and so all your cells are feeling it it's why you cry get upset you know you might start sweating like you can feel all of that um and you're kind of poking at that trauma kind of thing and picking at that scab and so it's really yeah. really important not to keep retelling your story over and over again and putting yourself back into that sort of yes of it's this int constant int introspection work that has yeah. that's a lot of like you said mm -hmm. scientific proof that you know keeping introspecting constantly and that's why sometimes certain form of therapy not all of them but for, for instance psychoanalysis etc mm -hmm. can be uh, can be a negative ha can have a negative impact so so whilst it can be great for certain things it, it, it for, for trauma and for things like that it can have some negative impact constantly introspecting Mama. that's yes. what you were saying before as well I totally yeah. agree with that yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> well people um can find me on instagram natasha coaches i'm on here um or they can email me thrive at natashamatani.com or just www.natashamatani.com. I do have a lot of exciting things happening next year, but I'm not allowed to talk about them yet. Secret ones. In the pipeline. But otherwise, it's one-to-one -one coaching. But I do one-to-one -one coaching. Um, actually, on Sunday, on Sunday this week, I'm doing what I call a summation ceremony. Um, oh. so summation ceremony 2021. And what it is, essentially, it's about 60 to 90 minutes, and it's almost like a live journaling session. So we'll All have right. we'll have loads of prompts, and it'll, it's free, um, and it's at 3.30 p.m. UK time. Okay. And it just gives people the opportunity to sort of reflect on the year gone by, think about what they can let go of in 2021, what served them, what didn't, and then to come up with powerful uh -huh. intentions for 2022. Awesome. Um, I'll make sure I'll share that if you send me the link. Um, I'm sorry I had a little little person interrupting me oh, at the end. That's okay. That's okay. That's <laughs> that's juggling motherhood and work, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I had closed the door, but somehow in this in this house they uh, yeah yeah <laughs> they navigate everywhere. <laughs> but it was so nice to talk to you and yes, um, thanks so yes. for having me <laughs> don't hesitate to ask natasha all your questions and to connect with her and we'll chat soon have a an, have a wonderful end of the year yeah. happy and holidays, holiday Tanya. thank you take care. bye everyone thanks for joining bye. Bye. thank you